From project reviews to incredible interviews, along with the general things in Web3, Crago's Crypto Corner covers the space in a fun and engaging way. We dive in so our listeners can conceptualize, plan, strategize, and implement their very next move. We are quickly becoming a platform that enriches and supports the overall foundation of Web3. In order to grow, you need your voice to be heard. If you have infinite curiosity, then Crago's Crypto Corner is just for you. Come join us. You're tuning into Crego's Crypto Corner, the best in Web3, blockchain, NFT, and cryptocurrency technology. Great reviews, incredible interviews with the leading people in the Web3 ethos, and sometimes just the general things Web3. Let's get to it in today's episode. Today's all about the roundtable. We're going to talk about strategy and a bunch of other great topics. But at the beginning of every episode, you guys know I have infinite curiosity. Let's get to it with my good friend, Ralph Cantero, with our weekly daily Ralpha update. What's up, Ralph? What is up, Crego? Nice to be here, as always. Excited ah. about tonight. Last week was a blast. I think we can top it even better this week. I do too. And, you know, I always say alpha comes in two forms, right? The alpha is the degen play when I'll get like a, a quick text from you. Craig, you got to get in on this. I'm just kidding. I'm putting you on the spot. People are like, hey, why don't you text me, Ralph? You know what's going on. And then the other one, which I think is way more important, and I think it goes back to today, uh, this last week's conversation, is the alpha is the is the actually learning, the plot, plan, strategize, and implement our next move in Web3. That to me is way more important because when you have education six months, a year from now, when you have an opportunity, you can say it was more based on skill set and knowledge and the right questions. And you can say luck played a little bit of a factor versus I won a lotto ticket, look at me. And then you lose right. it so quickly. So, yeah, I, I would absolutely agree. I mean, you, you have to put in the time, right? Like this space is like, like anything else. I think people are nostalgic about the early days of this space where people were minting things like board apes for 0 0.05 and and then just watching these this meteor rise to a lot of these projects going into the seven figure marks i think those days are behind us but you know it's more important today to actually research the teams the projects the roadmaps and everything going on before you decide what to get into i was actually just having that conversation with a friend of mine before coming uh, online tonight live for this show. Um, and she was saying, you know, if looking back at it, it, had I not made some of these silly decisions in aping into some of these projects, uh, my bags would be much better today. And I said, look, we have to take all of that as learning lessons. I think we've all been through that. Right. I, I think we all have to fail a little bit in this space uh, to, to gain some insights. And uh, if, if that's the case, I have, a, I, I have like an MBA and a PhD in this space by now. It's, it's, you know what, it's, it's a scholarship fund and it's going to roll us into the next thing, right? Scholarships are on losses. And Tony, if you can do a quick screen share so everybody can know what we're going to be talking about. Uh, I had a nice conversation offline with AJT, who is the founder of Goblin Town Illuminati, uh, Truth Labs, and indirectly uh, tonight's special guest, and we had him come back, I believe this is our third time, Mr. Stephen Miller, actually was the one to talk me into, and I'll say talk me into, said, this is why I'm in it, and this is why I'm passionate about it, and we'll have him share his thought. But I love the idea of these, bring this back real quick to that screen share, I just want to talk about these acceptance letters. So by holding uh, certain tokens in their ecosystem, I was able to get some of these letters. I was only able to get the general acceptance letter and the faithful uh, backer letter. And when I think about it, it's all, you can take off screen share. It's all, it's all in way of uh, strategy, gamification and storyline and bringing people directly into that IP experience and AJT and his team, super talented group of people. They really have that on lock. What are your thoughts on this community and how involved are you in this ecosystem? I'm very involved. So full transparency, everything in the truth ecosystem I own uh, from a bag perspective, it's the biggest bag I have across any individual project. So I'm holding more truth assets than anything else. Wow. And I, I really believe in, in, in what AJT is doing, Process Gray, that entire team, Cesar Kuriyama. It's an amazing group of artists, of uh, people who can execute, people who come from a very strong Web2 marketing background. And what was really interesting is, you know, I analyze uh, and research a ton of projects every single day. Um, as a matter of fact, I've put in more than 2,500 hours of research uh, into projects. And when this one came across my desk, without knowing who was behind it, uh, 
I, I knew right away that there was something special about it, right? There was the the tech that went into the website, the way that the leaderboards were put together, like all of these amazing things. And I remember including it as one of the early project finds in the Daily Ralph. And I was like, man, this is there. There is something here. And people are asking me, they're like, really? What like what's this all about? I'm like, just pay pay close attention. And then I found out, you know, that they were the team behind it, and it was just fascinating. It's been fascinating to watch. They had an incredible sellout today. It it just flew off the shelf at the at the very last minute, which was yeah. pretty impressive. Fifteen thousand. The PP the PP uh, frogs. Yeah. Peepees. I uh, I love what they're doing, but more importantly. If, if people don't get on the Alpha and Tony's laugh and he says pee pee and he just starts to laugh in the background, <laughs> shout out to Tony. We're Which, totally high school. Talk about Alpha. That to me is Alpha right there. So if everybody's listening, I'm not telling you to go degen in and go, but when I think about good buys and opportunities, I feel like I've grabbed some really good stuff in this ecosystem. And now that I look at it, I have three of the three of the Illuminatis. I have um three of the three of the letters, two, two different versions of it. Uh, and I also have uh, two of the believer passes. Probably going to pick up more because when Ralph Cantero says this is my biggest bag and he's not again, there's there's no other gain in it. You're not pumping a bag. This is sort of long term strategy. And we're going to talk about how the money is going to probably leave the meme coin ecosystem and going to move into NFTs. And we know that uh, Stephen Miller, our, our guest uh, today is uh, for the third time. He has some thoughts on it. And we also have MetaMat, our co-host, and we'll bring him in in a second. I do want to talk to you, and in a second, we'll have Tony uh, queue up a screen share, but daylight.xyz, I really like this because I, I called you last week and I said, Ralph, you know, how do I start to track things and, and not miss opportunities, right? So the, we next week, we're going to have Shield 3 on, which is Isaac, who's part of our JPEG fam. Right. I'm actually getting on a call with him on Saturday evening to take me through, and we talked about at a network level versus a contract level, and there are two big variations, and we'll cover that in next week's podcast along with talking about the Dow uh, for OCM and the Small Grants Committee with Sophia. Okay. But when you think about daylight.xyz, there we go, daylight.xyz, what's important for people to realize as they're tracking the tokens that they've gotten to and most importantly, not missing out on opportunities? And Tony, if you can queue up that screen share as Ralph is talking. Look, there's a lot of things going on in this space, as we all know. And as your collections continue to grow, it's very difficult to stay on top of everything that's going on. And when I discovered Daylight, I, you know, it was one of the tools that I that I researched uh, for my for my tools directory. I, I was mind blown because what Daylight does is that it takes all of the assets in your wallet and it specifically keeps track of any airdrop opportunities, any mint opportunities, anything that may be going on with any of the projects that you're holding. And it sends you email notifications. It sends you wallet notifications. So like it helps me stay on top of everything that's going on and it helps me make money. So a, a great example for me personally was um, as much as I look into art blocks, when the friendship bracelets came out several months ago that you know ended up doing so well, had I not gotten my daylight notification, I would have missed out on minting my uh, friendship bracelets, which ultimately for the amount that I was able to mint, I was able to sell some and recoup almost two ETH. So, uh, I mean, that, that tool more than pays for itself. And guess what? It's free, uh, which is incredible. Uh, so I, that's one of the tools that I highly recommend that along with fire. And we'll talk about fire next week. Um, you know, in addition to Shield 3. And then since you're the keeper of the pen and we were talking about DAOs and we were talking about AJT, um, throw a note down there. Maybe later on in the episode, we can talk a little bit about my first DAO because that's all part of uh, AJT's team as well. And I think that that's something that's going to benefit a lot of people in this space, myself included, yep. uh, in terms of uh, education. Yep. So so keep that Keep that handy and we can we can talk a little bit about that. One question for you, daylight.xyz before we move on. Wow, that's tripping me up. Uh, before we move on, my question is, do you get an email notification? How does it notifi notify you? Because I, notif I know that when I sign in, it sends me a notification to my email that it's verifying it's me. Is that how that happens? Yep. So I, I have my email notifications turned on. So I, I, I've made it a habit to just go into X, X, you know, daylight.xyz a couple times a week. Yep. Uh, it's, it's in my workflow. I always check on Mondays. I check again on Fridays, but I, I depend on the email. So throughout the week I may get an email, uh, saying, Hey, you know, there's a new mint opportunity or you need to go claim this, or there's a DAO vote that you need to participate in. Perfect. So I, I do pay a lot of attention to those notifications. Perfect. And one quick screen share before we bring in Mr. Stephen Miller and Meta Matt. 
Guys, as I've always said, every single week, we get our weekly daily Ralph update with Ralph Quintero. And it's so amazing to have him on, sharing his knowledge. It's a five minute or less read every single morning. As soon as that comes in at 7 a.m., I'm sitting there fresh with my cup of coffee. Get through that in five minutes, then walk the dog. All right, let's get to it with my co host, Mr. Meta Matt. What's up, my friend? Hey, how are we doing? What's up, You're in the metaverse. Yeah, <laughs> we're just pulling you in. I got the green screen today. So I, I, I had to match you a little bit. You, you have the amazing background there. I see some new merch back there too, huh? Which which merch are you talking about? So uh, to your that way, <laughs> yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the Rask. No, is that Rask right? No, right, right below it. I think in between J.P. Morgan and is that oh, and Rask? Yeah, that's, that's a rascal. I when the you skull. stepped out earlier before we went we, before you came online, we were talking. It's yeah. the Rask skull. Of that's the t-shirt. cool. I know. Yeah. I'm like left, right, which way's which. <laughs> we've, got, we've got some more really cool merch coming actually from Cryptoys. And speaking of which, tonight is their is their 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 drop at 9 p.m. and they've done big things. And we've oh we've got so much good stuff. Meta Matt. Tell me what what are your web three thoughts this week before we uh before we bring on Mr. Stephen Miller? I mean, honestly, it seems like the the uh, VCon was a big talk of the uh, town. I didn't personally go, uh, Ralph. I, I know you're you're big in the events with the uh, Miami. Did you go to VCon? I know that one's a little bit out there. I didn't. I went to uh, BTC 2023 and happy happy to chat about my experience on that. But it's also I, I'll, I'll just say this: it's the first time I've gone to a conference for just part of one day and didn't go back <laughs> so okay <laughs> interesting okay. i've see, I seen some mixed reviews on there as far as tiktok goes it's interesting that you said that well ordinal ordinals is flying i mean listen they're, they're doing a tremendous amount of volume i think they're they're an ultimate disruptor tomorrow night i have a call with one of our fellow on-chain monkeys jd it's going to take me through uh ordinals protocol a little bit maybe i'll grab some ordinals. I don't know what collection, but just for the fun of it, just because I'm a I'm a true degen champion like that. And you know, if if you're not you know spending a little money, what are you doing here? Just a little bit. I'm not telling you to go broke. Don't live in a cardboard box. But speaking of which, coming from where is he? There he is. I see him. Bring him up, Mr. Stephen Miller. How you doing tonight? What's going on, well, gentlemen? Good to see well, you. Hope you're having a great night so far. I'm what so made you? Bad. Sorry, what made you think that Steven was in a cardboard box? I thought I think that's the funniest thing ever. <laughs> it's it's the size, man. I look. I I take up a very small footprint of space. I could fit, but I prefer a bigger house. See why? Why do we have to go there? See, I I avoided that. I was running into that Ralph, and then I was like, I'm gonna just take a left and just welcome my friend on stage. <laughs> What's up, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Look, at least he's not out here calling me Oscar the Grouch or anything. Because true. honest to God, man, I'm I'm stoked to be here tonight. Nothing grouchy about me on this evening. Oh no. No, there's so much good stuff to talk about. And I guess is is my mic on? There we go. Uh I I guess I want to start to talk about, and we're gonna have AJT on. By the way, he's confirmed for June seventh. So I'm really excited to have him on, and we're gonna have you as a popping guest that that night as well, because you're very involved in the ecosystem, just like Ralph. And by the way, everyone. This is Ralph's biggest bag. If that's not Alpha, I don't know what is. And the big, by the way, the big ink mink, mink mint, the big, the big ink mint was so easy. It was quick. It was efficient. There was no problems, at least from my end. Uh, Steve, where do, where do we start on this? Man, where to start? Um, honest to God, man, I, I need to give a little bit of love to the genesis of it all because I think that it goes way under loved, but this entire project goes back to what is called the Illuminati NFT, right? It was the original secret society on blockchain, baby. Um, and it was a blast. It was a great project. Um, I did not originally meet Ralph through it, but I found out, you know, tangentially that we were actually both in it. And it has been honestly one of the best communities that I've joined. I really enjoy everybody in there. Um, and from everything I can tell, they are becoming just how Moonbirds is like the PFP for the art people, right? Like that's their brand now. I think that Illuminati, Goblin Town, every truth asset is now representative of the community of storytellers and lore builders. So I think that you have to understand that little piece of backstory to really understand what we're talking about here with Big Ink and everything else. So that's where I would tell you to start. So IP, how he has taken, I think it's King, a ding, 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 ding dong and King something. What, what are those? They're two names, right? One is going to get 40 ETH, I guess, in back 
uh, from having 1% rev share on secondary market sales for Goblin Town. And uh, that was the f- first or second person to, to mint the 187 collection, which was, again, a smart contract flaw. They had to stop it. And then how they did an about face and then how they honored the first two holders was phenomenal. And then the other person gets the uh, 1% off of the merchandise. So how you see them building is really cool. But I think when we think about rarity and traits, and I don't know if this occurred to you, I'm sure it did, Steve and, and Ralph, uh, when you think about how unique rarity and traits, and I always say, oh, I'm going to go for the floor. I'm just going to grab floor stuff because I want to have involvement in their ecosystem at the lowest cost and have the, the highest uh, up, up value. But how they can actually take one particular digital asset in that ecosystem and how they can make it a star. It can be assigned to something. It can then have extra created value. Uh, I think is really cool for those first two people in the ecosystem. And I think it was with the big ink letters, the one that had the keys at the very end. There there was no price attached to that because the one person that owns that has a percentage of ownership. Talk to me a little bit about the IP gameplay and how he's differentiating it differently than other people doing Creative Commons license and other people saying, yeah, you can do whatever you want with your your monkey or your ape or, you know, whatever. How is this vastly different? Because that's what I'm feeling. So let's put that one to the IP holder himself, right? I don't I don't own any IP here. Let's talk to Ralph about that one. Ralph, what do you think of it all? Look, I I think it's a brilliant move. So I've had this conversation with a lot of friends. I am one of the original 187 holders. Um, I had four of those. I've since sold two. I'm holding two right now. And like I said, I have I have a lot of truth assets. And back when everybody was talking about CC zero and and IP rights and everything going on, um, AJT and his crew came out and said we're going to kind of turn this on his head. And this is how we're thinking about IP. And one of the things that they said was, let us manage the IP for the 187. That's what it started with. And, you know, I thought about it and I've been in the business world for quite some time. Uh, You know, on the sales and marketing side, I can very easily go out and negotiate my own IP contracts uh, and licensing deals. But the reality of it is, who do I really want negotiating an IP deal? Myself? Who, who, I mean, I definitely have a vested interest uh, or do I want the, the, person who actually created the collection that that has this vision of where it can go and they want to see it succeed and let them negotiate the uh licensing rights on my behalf with my input and that's 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 my vote uh and i'm i'm thrilled that that's how they're handling it um i think i think that's very similar to the way that luca nets is handling it with the way that they're doing the the toy sales now so i think we're going to see more and more projects maybe want to move in that direction and I think for the project long term, it helps maintain a, a little semblance of control over what you want the assets used for, because otherwise it becomes pretty pretty spread out. And I'm not knocking anybody else's approach, right? But I've seen, like for example, board apes on beer, on honey, on uh, you know all different kinds of things. Um, you know, again, not knocking it, but like it it feels a little disjointed. Whereas if, if Yuga would have taken control of the IP and worked together with the IP holders, I think it would have been even more effective. So I want to, I want to slide into another uh, area, which I think is incredibly important. Sotheby's is selling uh, the eye popping set of blue chip NFTs from the collection of failed crypto hedge fund, three arrows capital to get back those funds. I believe three, $3.5 $3.5 billion. And I believe recently this past week, a Denza sold. And it's a key indicator. And I know your meta play, Steven, as these, uh, these S coins uh, will be circling back into our digital asset ecosystem. I, I know what your play is, and we're going to get to that in a second. And I know what mine is, but mine is for the love of it. Yours is just, I think, purely money. Just saying. Just kidding with you. A little, little jab at you. But The bigger question that I have for you guys is, is that a good indicator when you're going to see so many of these collections selling? And this is, they have all the prominent blue chips. I guess they're going to have one other uh, major collection, which they're calling the Grail, uh, which I guess is going to be launched next week. What are your thoughts around that, Steve? And then you, Ralph? So this is actually really interesting to me because I think that the Grail's collection itself was a great idea. And the way they've gone about it has been... (laughs) 
it hasn't been rubbing your face in the fact that these are three arrows assets, right? Like that's probably the biggest thing that could have gone wrong here. And they had Ralph, you'll probably be able to speak to this better than I, I can because I'm going off memory here. But it was either Sotheby's or it was Christie's. It was trying to do a big glitch art, um, you know, series. And they totally just blew the launch. It was terrible. They didn't consider the artists much at all. In this case, they did the opposite. And you saw a really good um, rollout of trying to sell these assets. And there were some incredible pieces in this collection. Just yeah. straight away, incredible pieces. And I believe in the art long term. I do. Um, and I think that real, real investors came into this and saw it for the opportunity that it was. And they didn't over market it as something that was, you know, come and capture these three arrows assets. It was doing right by the people that ultimately got hurt by three arrows collapsing. Yep. I, I, I would agree. I think that this is a brilliant collection. I was happy to see that Fidenza sell for, for just over a million dollars. I think that they'll recoup some of that money. I don't think that they're going to recoup all of those billions. Uh, there's, there's not enough assets in the collection to, to cover that, but I think that they're doing it right. And it was Sotheby's that, that botched the glitch art sale. Um, you know, there's there's mixed there's mixed feelings about that. I I don't know that they actually botched the sale itself. I think that it was in the curation of the artists that were selected. Originally, it was all male artists. They didn't consider any female artists, and then they swung the pendulum too hard the other way, and they got caught in the in the back and forth of the political discourse. And I think that that hurt them. But ultimately, they have a really strong Web3 team at Sotheby's. I respect them a lot. Uh, they're doing a lot of things for the space. They're the, also the ones who, who led the charge for creating the Sotheby's marketplace. So it's, it's people who are in the know, in the space, uh, and, and they're doing a lot of things to move the space forward, which I always applaud. Yeah, the, uh, the Grails collection, just fun fact, it was, uh, it's worth you know, around $2.4 million is what they said. Uh, they still owe around three point five billion dollars to creditors. So, <laughs> no matter yeah. are you saying that we're a little short if we bust out the cash. Little, little <laughs> short. They, one of them is apparently CryptoPunk NFT number six six four nine. So there's a CryptoPunk in there. Oh, there, there is, and it's actually a it's really simple, clean. Right? It's a very clean CryptoPunk, which I was surprised for the amount that it went. Uh, I thought it was fairly inexpensive uh, for <laughs> for the kind of punk that it is. <laughs> so I I want to talk about the the big meta, and so. My love is art, and I believe that the the ultimate uh, meta, which is a key indicator, we think we talked about, and I still come back to the lipstick and and uh, women shopping for the lipstick and the underwear. What are these key indicators for us as we can plot, plan, and strategize? Good alpha. Uh, but Steve Miller, you you have a different thought as to where the digital asset ecosystem is going to go heavily once meme coin season is over, whatever that means. What are your thoughts? Well, first and foremost, and I spoke to Ralph about this earlier today, um, there will always be another meme coin season. Always. Agreed. But the time is officially turning back to NFTs, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, I think it needed to happen. It's about damn time, if you ask me. Um, but I, I really think a lot about where is that next move going, right? Like where we see the money flow from Pepe and all these other ones. Because we've seen so much money flow out of that segment. Yep. It's, just, it's not going to be from Ben. It's not going to be from PSYOP. <laughs> believe you me. Um, it came out of Pepe and it's been sitting on the sidelines. It minted a lot of fresh millionaires. A lot of them. And I ask myself, okay, where does that money go next? What makes the most sense? And out of the conversation that Ralph and I had earlier today, I think that we are both in agreement on one of two. And it's the one that I'm very, very bullish on is the sports segment. Mm. I think you're going to see a lot a lot go that way. Um, and I want to throw it to Ralph on that one because he's got another thought. We'll unpack all of it in a few. Yeah, I, I I agree with Steven on this one, right? I think I think money flows to two segments, sports and music. Uh, I continue to be bullish on music NFTs. I still think that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there. And there's a lot of smart people working on plays in in that regard. But sports, what I what I love about it and, and why I think I agree with Steven on this so much is if you look at the degen nature of us traders in the NFT space, it's very much aligned with the degen sports betters and you know and and sports fanatics yeah. so there's there's a lot of similarities and we can draw a lot of parallels between both of those communities 
Um, and I think it's just a natural, it's a natural extension of, of either side to cross over. So I, I agree with Steven on this one. I think, I think we're going to see a pretty strong sports season coming up. And, and just like on the music side, there's a lot of really smart people doing things on the sports side of things. You don't think they're putting it into like Bitcoin or Ethereum or the actual crypto assets? Or you e- think they're going right for the... Matt, uh, Matt, we're talking about the most degen of degens right now. I <laughs> mean, they, they love their dollar cost, yeah. uh, dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin. Like, uh, but yeah, no, there are... I mean, what, what are some of the NFTs that you would be looking at as far as like the music? I, hey, I, was just, I was just about to get to that, Matt. I'm glad you <laughs> asked the question because these two men are like, sports NFTs, hey, uh, Ralph, let me toss the ball over to you. What do you think? And you know what we didn't hear? Give us some names, guys, of, of or people, that, people, communities that that our listeners can do research on. Because it's not enough for you just to tell us this well, is yeah. this where it's going music and, and our, uh, sports. We want to know, right, Matt? Yeah, well, I've heard about Pepe. I haven't heard about, I don't know about any. I, I know this. Yeah. Know, the ones we from like, you know, during the bull we run. But give me, give me some that are doing like good now or well now. <laughs> well, let's, let's start here. Ralph, talk, talk data to me. Right, not not talk dirty to me. This is a wow. good show, a positive yeah. G, PG rated show. Talk data to me because there is one such collection that has been making moves lately. Break that down for the folks. So, if we think back to the beginning of the NFT run, I would say that most people would agree that what really kicked off NFT season back in early 2021 was Top Shot. Uh, that was the first real consumer facing application of NFTs when people were buying uh, these NBA moments. And, and that really spurred a tremendous amount of NFT activity in the hundreds of millions of dollars a month. I mean, it was just a, a ridiculous amount of NFTs uh, being traded. We've since seen that die down and it would, you know, just systematically month after month after month declining, especially throughout the bear market. Now, what's interesting is over the course of the last six or seven weeks, uh, if you track top shot sales, you'll see that it's slowly starting to come back and it's increasing. And there's there's a lot of reasons for that. But, you know, when I was talking to Steven earlier, one of the things that we were talking about was one specific athlete. And I'll, I'll throw it back to him and, and we can banter back and forth a little bit. But I, I think that we will be seeing a resurgence uh, in Top Shot, especially as we're coming into the finals, especially as we're coming into draft season. So that that can kick it off. And then I think we should talk about that particular platform a little bit. And then we can talk about some of these other sports projects that I think are, are interesting as well. I love the NBA Top Shot, which is on the Flow blockchain. And who else is on the Flow blockchain? Our good friend, Will Ryan Rob from Cryptoys. And by the way, if you guys aren't involved three in Three minutes away. Three minutes away. I would highly recommend that you check that out. It was just top of the hour. And I, how can we not show love to a he fellow? He has some cool there. Star Wars stuff that just came out. I saw all over Twitter. Yeah. He is. Now, I know I divested. I know I went off the track. So I'm going to throw this back over to you, Steve. What are your thoughts? So I'm starting to get really impressed with Flow Blockchain. I haven't played too much in that ecosystem. But what I can say is this. When it comes down to it, that's where sports NFTs live. Point blank. You don't need to take it much further than that. They've got La Liga NFTs on flow, NBA Top Shot on flow, NFL All Day on flow, UFC Strike, right? You've got everything. If you if you're if you're a sports fan, for the most part, you've got you've got a place to to play here. Um, Panini, you know, of America and Panini Global have their own unique thing. Tops does their um, you know baseball mm-hmm. NFTs on on ETH. Mm-hmm. They haven't really picked up because the marketing there has been a little shoddy. And they just got acquired by Fanatics. So my personal bet is stay on the flow blockchain. That's where the money's at. But the reason why I'm super bullish and why I think that NBA Top Shot's going to be the play has a lot more to do with timing. Because you have two major events that are currently on like, like they're right on the precipice of happening, right? You've got the NBA Finals, which are eventually, not yet, but eventually going to feature Rob's uh, I'm sorry. Wow. Where's my, where's my head at? Mr. Quintero's um, famed Miami heat, as well as um, the Denver nuggets, big play there, big players. They're all, they're going to be a lot of featured assets on um, top shot when the finals hit. Now, what else is happening? If I ask you guys about the, um, the name Wemby, do you know who I'm referring to? Okay, I've heard of it. We're talking about a guy named Victor Wembenyama. 
is the most hyped rookie since LeBron. Okay, everybody's losing their minds about it in the sports card trading world to the point that those assets right now, he just had his first rookie card debuting in Bowman Inception U literally last week. It's now selling for $12,000 just right off the cuff. So people know about this kid and he is the real deal. So I would tell you the second that he debuts on Top Shot after the draft, which is happening mid-June, we're going to see a pop. And it's going to be something that a lot of people watch. And that data trickling in that you just heard about, I am confident that Ralph is right. Because that's what we're going to start seeing a lot more um, you know, money flow towards the second that we get to both of those events coinciding at once. So I'm amped about it. I think it's almost locked and loaded at this point. Not so, financial advice. Yeah. I, I, I want to throw something else back. Uh, Knights of DGEN. Drew Austin, big shout out to him yep. with their building in the community. By the way, I was just scrolling through his page. He retweeted NBA Top Shot. So look at these parallels. You draw these lines, you start to make sense. And again, don't overspend. Don't go broke. We don't want to see anybody else in a cardboard box. Isn't that right, Steve? God forbid. <laughs> well, by the way, we we hit the, we hit the access. access and, and I'm not going to use the F word, but we messed around and we found out together. Steven calls me a couple weeks and goes, Craig, what do you think about this bad idea? I go, it's such a bad idea. I'm going to send you some money right now and we'll double this bad idea in together. And then a couple days later, I said, hey, Steve, you know, I haven't heard from you. I'm going to assume we're not millionaires. He goes, Craig. Do you look behind me? I said, oh, yeah, I still got the cardboard box. And we're, <laughs> we're still working our way out of the cardboard box. But you know what? Metaphorically speaking, Steve, we're champions. And in the bull market, people are going to be like, oh, my God, Steve, can I get your autograph? And I'm like, stay away from him. You're going to hire me as security. And then Ralph, we'll, Ralph we'll, where's your soundboard? You needed that for that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a dad joke for the night. But so two sports NFTs, right? NBA Top Shot. And then I also want people to, to dive into the Knights of, Gen, uh, Knights of D-Gen ecosystem. Um, I've always been a big fan of what Drew has done. We've had him on the podcast in the past. Hopefully, we'll get him back on again in the future. So I want to share with you guys a little bit of where I think my meta lies. And then I want to talk about some Twitter spaces, my favorite Twitter space. I've actually gone down to one. And, and again, lots of love to NFT Bark and, and Captain. But I have my favorite space, and I'll tell you why. And it's, it's maybe not for the obvious that people will think that it is. I think it's because of the alpha that I get and the information, and I'm going to share that with you guys in a little bit. But if we can do the um, do a, a quick screen share, all right? So, and Ralph, I know that you know a lot about this uh, particular the Hume Collective, uh, but when I think about art and I also think about music, I'm very bullish on these two, and I'm taking my time to be picky because right now, as there's a lack of liquidity in the NFT ecosystem, it gives us time to plot, plan, strategize, and implement our move. And so sometimes I'll text you and say, hey, what do you think of this? And I've come across a couple projects. So I'm going to throw out a couple at you, and I want to hear your, your, your feedback. And then, Steve, if you know anything, Meta, if you have any thoughts, let us know. So one is the Hume Collective. The other one is Anna Luca. Uh, and then also we're going to talk about the IP of Pudgy Penguins. And then I also want to talk about Alamo. Uh, and there are a few other. So maybe let's just start first at Alamo. Ralph, what do you know about Alamo? And uh, to me, I like the feeling that it evokes. I like the art. It reminds me of camp in 1989 when I was a kid at Wampasset in Litchfield, Connecticut. So yep. there's sort of a, a nostalgia there for me. What are your thoughts around this? Look, I love Alamo as an artist. I respect him. He's one of the nicest human beings I've ever met. And, and it's funny that you mention the nostalgia that you get when you see his art, because that's exactly how I feel. Um, I've been following and collecting his art for quite some time now. He's actually uh, minting a new collection called Summertime Tomorrow on Nifty Gateway. It's actually a Nifty Gateway curated collection. I'm very proud of him. He's he's really hustled and worked his way up to that. So that's a huge accomplishment for any artist. Um, but I'm very happy for him. I got a chance to hang out with him in New York uh, during NFT NYC. And uh, the piece that he was exhibiting there was actually a... I, I hate the word fidgetal, but I'll use it. It was a fidgetal piece. It was a, a, a physical art piece.
piece canvas that had a digital frame um, kind of embedded into it. So it was both digital and physical and it was phenomenal. So he's, he's always cutting edge. He's always working to bring other artists up. And, and a lot of times he curates uh, collections for other artists, but you know, this is kind of his moment in the sun and I'm absolutely thrilled to, to support him tomorrow. And like yeah. I said, that's going, that's going live tomorrow. And it's, and it's a really interesting mint mechanic. I'll, I'll, I'll share that for a second. Uh, Please. Uh, so he's he's launching four different pieces tomorrow. Two of them are going to be open editions and two of them are going to be blind editions. And what that means is he's not going to tell us which is which, but anybody can go in and I believe the mint price is $75. You're going to be able to go and mint any of these four pieces. The open editions are just going to be open for the whole time that the that the open edition period is open. But the blind editions, he has preset a quantity for each one of those. And once that quantity is met, that those pieces will will stop being sold. Um, and that's interesting because that that could generate uh, a lot of scarcity in those particular pieces. But nobody knows which ones they are. And then for anybody who mints all four pieces you will get a physical drawing uh, of all of the kind of mock-ups that went into making this collection. And then he will also send you a, a digital NFT of that particular mock-up as well. So I, wow. I think it's an incredible value uh, for an amazing artist. And I'm excited to see that drop tomorrow. Now, not on purpose did I pick that. I That's alpha, guys. That's That right there to me is value. So let me just throw one question at you because we talk about the nuance of this space. One of my first experiences in, in grabbing my first NFT was on Nifty Gateway because you could buy with cash. Uh -oh. And it sat on their platform. And I was actually able at a certain point to move it over to my MetaMask wallet, right, where I had custody of it. What are your thoughts around Nifty Gateway and leaving your NFTs on there, or do you like to bring it over and have custody of it yourself? I've done both. I've ported NFTs over just to have them, all, you know, in one place. Uh, I have a lot that I've left on Nifty. It it depends on what I'm going into. Like what I love, and and you alluded to it, is the frictionless approach that they have, where you can come in and buy something with fiat, with a credit card, with crypto, like whatever you want. You have the flexibility to do. Um, and I think that if, if we're all honest about our goal of wanting to onboard as many people as possible into the space, you need that kind of stuff. And most people don't really care where they have it as long as they have it. Um, you know, I think it's more of the purists who are like, oh, if, you know, it's kind of, you know, not your keys, not your wallet kind of thing. Yeah. Look, I, I think if we're going to grow in, this into mainstream, we're going to have to be comfortable with the fact that some people are going to custody some of these assets and there's got to be a, a certain level of trust. Um, right. You know, I don't, I don't foresee Nifty Gateway going away. I also didn't foresee FTX going away. And, and there were a lot of people that lost a lot of NFTs as that went down, like Coachella passes and things like that. So, you know, th there's always a, a potential for somebody going down, but we could say that about, real world businesses too, right? Like, yeah. you know, if you had money in any of these banks that went under uh, or Enron stock or, or any of these traditional businesses that just disappeared in same, same kind of thing. Right. Um, so you're, it, it's never 100% foolproof and, and, and fail proof, but you know, you, you place your bets where, where you think that, you know, they're going to be around for the long haul. Diversification is your friend. And so I, don't have an issue with Nifty Gateway. Just kind of curious to see what you do. And you're like, not for the concern, but again, anything, anything is crazy, you know, anything is possible in this crazy space. And the next person I do want to talk to you about is uh, Anna Luca. Uh, I came across her as well. I'm, I think you might have had this actually in the Daily Ralpha, if I'm correct. Uh, but again, this is many great things that I come across. I like to look at the emerging artists. Again, my big meta play is I'll get some of the sports stuff because I understand that's where the money might go. And based on a lot of the conversations, again, we just connected a parallel. You know, if, if Drew Austin, who is deep in this space, Knights of DGen is retweeting other other things such as uh, also Cryptoys, which is now a few minutes past uh, its drop. You know, these are all things that you just start drawing the lines with the people that are really doing big things in the space. And you say, ah, if this is where they are as visionaries 
And they've also generated not only a lot of money in their, their mints, but also their secondary sales. Something to perk your ears up to. Steve, you know, before we get into Anna Luca, what are your thoughts, um, you know, on, on Nifty Gateway and any of the, the main platforms where you can move your items over to your private wallet? Any thoughts on that? Because we're going to talk about wallet hygiene, of course. I think the biggest thing that you have to go back to is the age old saying, right? If, and if you've been here since like, we keep going back to ensgod.eth. Come on, folks. I'm not a ensgod.eth. Um, it's, it's, it's adorable. I appreciate it. I'm basically ENS uh, cardboard box.eth based on this show. Oh, they were going um, there. <laughs> but none, nonetheless, I got to go back to the old saying, right? Uh, been knowledgeable of this saying since 2017. Um, not your keys, not your cheese. And that applies the very same thing. Not your keys, not your NFTs, right? You got to keep those things in mind. I don't believe in keeping it on exchanges. Even if Coinbase NFT had panned out into something material, which it didn't, I was not going to keep my NFTs over there. I was going to put them onto a hardware wallet into cold storage and then proceed to not sell any of them because why realize profits? Um, <laughs> right um no but like that's that's I the way, it, way i see it right. i was like wait a minute <laughs> it's yeah. like i like illiquidity not liquidity right oh yeah and i'm the king of illiquidity all right all right let's talk about anna anna luca i thought this was really cool in this this whole quilts project and how they're doing the the digital art and she seems such like uh not just a talented artist but one that's a conscientious artist as well and really wants to make uh an impact and i'm noticing that as sort of the trend as i'm reading the daily ralpha and seeing every single day a new incredible artist and we're not short for artists in this world of creativity tell me a little bit about her so it's it's really interesting. Uh, she's a generative artist that takes on real world projects. And one of the things that she started working with, one of these communities that she started working with is this um, guild of quilters uh, called G's Bend Head. Uh, and what they do is they, they're known to make some of the most iconic quilts in the world. And she worked with this guild to create NFT versions of these quilts. And they are absolutely fascinating. And one of the things that I love is that she's using her platform to bring to light the work that these ladies do and have been doing for so many years. Uh, it's a project I absolutely love. When you mint the NFT, you, you also have uh, the ability to claim the quilt. They're not cheap by any means, but this is one of those examples of the, the digital world meeting the physical world and what I would think is a really cool use case application of Web3. All right. So, you know, I want to talk about my favorite Twitter spaces, which is the NFT Collector Show. It's with you, Ralph, Mr. Pink, uh, Mr. Pink NFT, uh, Avis14, and Peace Frog ETH. And um, I'll tell you why I like the show. There's a lot of strategy. It's not overtly busy or complex, complicated. So I'm able to actually understand, uh, as when I say that, understand at a very ground level, uh, you know, some of, I feel like some of the Twitter spaces, they can get complicated or they can get mucked up in the, in the, in the, uh, in the mud, right? They're just, they're stuck. They're, they're playing around too much. And again, that's fine. Uh, there's every space different for everybody. Maybe I'm just, I don't know, going to be 46. So what I'm wanting is a more matured space. I'm wanting conversation that has movement. And this happens every Monday evening, if I'm correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tuesday, Tuesday evening. Tuesday evening. I apologize. Tuesday evening. And when I tune in, it's funny, Monday through Friday doesn't matter from one day to the next, but Tuesday evenings. And you said 7 p.m.? 8 p.m. 8 p.m. There we go. Tuesday evenings, 8 p.m. I... I love that about your space and the conversation flows. Uh, Mr. Pink just makes so many great points. Peace Frog as well. And um, I just would invite people on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. to tune in to, to that show on Twitter Spaces. You grab so much value from that. And anybody who's listening in on the Spaces, go follow Ralph and then go just set a reminder when that comes out. And you you guys usually post it, what, the day before on Monday? Yeah, either usually Monday, Mr. Pink is the one who posts it. It's, you know, I, I appreciate you giving me flowers on that show. It's been, it's been tremendously fun. We've been doing it for a little over a year now. Um, and it's, it's just four friends talking about art, talking about alpha, talking about whatever's going on in our minds. 
Um, I, I will tell you, it's it's not even remotely close to being as polished as this amazing show that we're on right now. Uh, um, Craig is the ultimate Twitter space host. I have never worked with anybody who's, who preps more, who, who puts so much time, energy, effort, and care into the product that he's putting out. That's not what we do on Tuesday nights, but to Craig's point, we do share a lot of really actionable, valuable information uh, from a very diverse group of people, right? Mr. Pink is very much involved in the space as am I, um, but he brings a perspective from, from a, a, a collector and somebody who makes things happen for artists. I come at it from the research and alpha perspective. AVS comes at it uh, from the art perspective. He's a, tr a traditional art collector who has deep roots in the traditional art world, uh, knows the family of Andy Warhol, has worked with some of the most amazing artists in the world, and he actually has an incredible in real life art collection. Uh, which is mind-blowing. And then Peace Frog comes at it from a community perspective, and we really just shoot the shit and, and have a lot of fun. And, and, you know, we just talk about whatever's on our mind, but it's always around art and alpha and collecting. It's funny. I should know that it's Tuesday evenings because obviously we do on Wednesday, and I have to say this being our second week uh, at 8.30 p.m., I'm having to get adjusted to the time between work and kids, I got it, Tuesday evening, 8 p.m., and I've listened to it enough, and I don't want people to think, oh, I'm giving flowers just because you're on my show every week. No, it's it's really, it's an easy listen. I've gained a lot of knowledge, and I feel like what you just said, like those behind-the-scenes things, I did not know until you just told us all. But I do want to talk to you guys about Twitter space strategy, and by that I mean there are a couple things that I do when I'm going to press that request to speak button, right? And I was thinking about it at first, right? We all came in, you want to grow your platform, you want to grow your digital asset community. If you're the founder, you're the dev, you're a mod, you want to be known, you want to feel special, great. But my thing is when I go into a spaces and I want to hear what you guys think, I'll listen for about five minutes. The first minute I know I'm going to stay. The next five minutes is if I'm going to speak, what is it that I'm going to say that's going to add value? And more importantly, am I intently listening to the content? The other thing that I do is I go up to the um, to the tweets that have been posted and I'll scroll through them to see if there's anything that resonates with me and what I'm interested in. And as I said right now, my big meta to collect, which is not about money, is art. So Alamo, going to be jumping into that tonight to support Will. After this podcast, I'm grabbing some crypt toys. You know I am. So for me, as I build my collection, there's there's a fulfillment in that. And I think going through that, that scholarship time to know the losses is really important. But as I said, I take notes. I figure out what it is that I'm going to say. And then when I'm going through the, the, the Twitter spaces, I'm going through the, the pinned tweets. There we go. And I'm seeing if there's something that resonates. And if it does, then I'll speak on it. So, Ralph, let me throw this to you. And then, Stephen, I want to hear what is your Twitter space strategy when you're not in a space that you were either host or co-host? So I, I have a couple of spaces that I listen to regularly uh, and that I participate in. Uh, I love Coffee with Cap. That's my favorite morning show whenever, whenever I am around and I can listen to it. I, I absolutely love it because I know that they're always going to deliver value. They're going to be honest. They're going to be funny. They're going to be engaging. We talk about conspiracy theories all the time, which I absolutely love. Uh, I love conspiracy theories. Uh, so it's, it's quite entertaining for me. Outside of that, I, I think I have a very similar strategy to you in, in where I'm coming in. Uh, I'm, I'm like, if I have some downtime or I'm walking the dog or, or driving somewhere, I'll, I'll start scrolling through the Twitter spaces that are live. And I pay a lot of attention to what the title is. And I'll come in and see, first off, I, I look and see if anybody who I, I follow uh, or follow me are sitting in that Twitter space. And that, that gives me a good feeling for the quality of the space. Um, how many of the people, you know, who I engage with on a regular basis have taken their time to be on that space. I also look and see if they've shared anything and, and I will usually hang out for 10, 15 minutes and see if, if, you know, they've got my engagement. If I don't feel engaged, I, I won't dedicate any more time to it. I'll likely jump and go find another one. Um, but most of the time I'm joining Twitter spaces either to learn something or to be entertained. That's, that's my strategy. That's a good strategy. It sounds a uh, similar parallel to mine. And Steve, is there something more that you could add to what we've just gone over as far as Twitter space strategy and, and growing your, your brand? I mean, you've got to think about it from both perspectives. Well, all three, are you hosting or are you trying to appear as a guest or are you trying to just simply tune in and find good quality spaces? 
right? One of the things that I love about uh, the Tuesday night show with Ralph, Mr. Pink, um, and everybody else who's on that, Peace Frog and um, you know Dow Jones, phenomenal shows have a balance, right? You need to have a character on that show that's got all of the attitude and energy in the world. In that show, it's Mr. Pink. Then you've got people that add value, right? That would be, of course, our good friend Ralph Cantero. There's so many different ways to think about it, but from there, once you achieve a balance, that makes for a great space. It keeps things entertaining, keeps value adding back to your audience. If you're just trying to appear and you want to enhance your brand, you need to be thinking about how can I add value? How can I continue to build up the people that are around me in this space, right? The people that you surround yourself with ultimately determines how successful you are. So are you going up onto stages with people that can build you up and you can build them up? If you're looking for good spaces, look for all of that, right? If you can go and find a space where the people on stage are not just hogging mic or are not just um, speaking for the sake of being heard, that makes for a better experience as a listener. And you don't want to waste your time on spaces that are too much of that. So that would be my little, my little piece of input there. Um, but definitely think out if you're going to try hosting your spaces for the very first time, think about the concept. Think about what you want to actually achieve with it and what type of audience you want to build. If you can go into it with that, you're going to set yourself up for, for success, in my opinion. That's some great alpha right there, because I feel that that's so important. If you're going to build in this space long term, those tips, tricks, and again, I, I think, Steve, you, you're so right, right? Balance. What is the perspective? Are you coming in as, as a listener? Are you coming in with the attention to speak? So really important. And we're going to get to some more exciting stuff. But before we do, I want to thank those that are tuning in, right? We got Wylan in there. I see you, buddy. Uh, at Doctrine, I think that's how I say it. Um, Matt Swayze, I see you. Batman, thank you so much for popping in. Uh, William, we'll have you up after spaces to talk about AI and writing abilities. Incredible writer in the space. Uh, Itonic, I see you as well. I appreciate you. Uh, so, you know, I, I do want to say one thing to, um, to Ralph's point, right? When people speak on conspiracy and someone goes, that's a conspiracy theory, Ralph. Here's how you respond to them. Hey, do you think there could be more to the story than what we're just hearing on the news, whether it's left or right? Just ask the question, throw your hands up so gently and see how that works. Um, that's, that's my thoughts. And one of the things that I do want to talk about, because right, we always get so passionate about onboarding Web2 normies into Web3, because I feel like once you've tasted the Web3 drug, that the NFT or the crypto, it just pulls you in. And uh, I'm, I'm fiending to talk about this. So, Tony, if you can, in between rubbing that beautiful mustache of yours, if you could do us to a screen share, Mike, I had to. I'm sorry. So Coinbase won. Now, I, I, first, Steve, I want to get your opinion on this. And I, I like it for a few reasons. We're all going, before we get on the highway, your on-ramp is going to be your centralized platform. Now, yeah, you can do MoonPay and you can buy directly in crypto and you can, ah, I'm going to stick with Coinbase. What are your thoughts on Coinbase One with zero trading fees? I mean, it's going to cost a little bit each month. I think you can try it for a limited period of time, pre-filled out tax forms, boosted staking rewards, uh, dedicated support team, whatever that might mean, and then exclusive offers. It's kind of like, hey, if you get this, that's sort of a sizzle statement. But overall, do you think that this has more value than what it's going to charge per month? It's a really good question. Um, I think that for the user, there's a lot of value there, but the user has to ask themselves, how much am I actually going to be trading? Right. If you can offset that cost based on what the normal fees are going to be, it's a no brainer. Like, right. why, wouldn't, why wouldn't you use Coinbase one just for that alone? Um, but if you're going to be a casual, you know, once in a while trader, you're going to make big, lump transactions bring a bunch of ETH into the ecosystem to come spend on NFTs over here with me and me and Ralph. Right. Um, you don't need it. You need one transaction to pull over all of that ETH and then send it to your wallet on your MetaMask or your ledger, wherever it is that you choose. Right. That's all, all you really need, right? right. Um, so you have to ask yourself in your unique case, what do you need? Um, I do think that there, there are definitely merits to it. I think it's a really powerful new model that or more people need to be thinking about like, you know, I want to see Kraken do something outside of the norm or do something reliable for once shots fired. Indeed. <laughs> uh, but uh -huh. that's, that's what you need. You need more innovation in the space. And I'm not sure if I can call this quite innovation. It's a SaaS model in a lot of ways, um, but I like it. I think it's going to be good. You know, 
crypto, you know, when we think about cryptocurrencies and we want to, we want to enhance the user experience. And so when I think about Coinbase or Binance, I, I don't love going on to Binance. And again, it's nothing against CZ. Shout out to you if you're listening, but I yeah, like you are. But when I look at Coinbase, it, it's so user friendly. It's so easy to send things back and forth. I like that they've got educational material on there. It's not where I'm going for my stuff at this point. But I feel like when people have to learn and you're going to introduce some something to someone, such as when we think about Cryptoys, very easy to use platform, very easy to purchase with your credit card. This to me is exciting because that's going to onboard more people. So when I think long-term collections that are going to grow in value, it's when people can discover it and own it in a way in which is not intimidating. Say, yeah, I have NFTs. Oh, what, what's your hot wallet? What's your cold wallet? And which, by the way, we'll talk about hygiene. They're not going to have to say that because it's not going to matter. And they're going to just be able to hook onto that platform. And then that platform is then going to give them the option through an educational resource to create an, an, a wallet within its own ecosystem. And they're going to be able to be introduced to it directly from the platform itself. I'm not saying that's where Cryptoys is going, but that's what I see happening is they build a fan base. They build a storyline. They integrate and build off of that IP, all the things that they're doing. I mean, the connections that they have, I mean, Cryptoys. I mean, that to me is exciting. Uh, it's exciting to see what Illuminati uh, Truth Labs is doing. Um, and AJT, when I spoke with him the other day, just to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation to see how he thinks. That high-level thinking is just, those are the people, those are the communities that get me excited. That's when I come alive at, what, what do we have? 9.25 at night. We still got a little more to go through, gentlemen. So let's talk about wallet hygiene. And I'm, I'm going to start with you, Ralph. Now, I know that, you know, Josh Young, when he came on the podcast, he said, security through obscurity. So I'm not telling you, I'm not going to ask you, well, Ralph, how many wallets do you have? Ralph, where do you hide your phrase? We're not, that's not where we're going. Where we're going is- You don't want my seed phrase? No, no. You know what? I, I, I value our friendship more. You can keep your stuff. I'm good. I, this is way more utility for me than your seed phrase. That's how I judge this relationship on a you, work level. Personal level? Do you know what, Ralph, everyone? I'll so take your seed phrase. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know, you're done. You're out of here. <laughs> I love you, Matt. Damn, I should have taken that over under on who was going to get kicked out first. <laughs> <laughs> Never. You know, we've been running strong, man. I, I I have to say, I haven't really, I don't even, I don't have, I've never had an argument with either one of you. And I'd feel very uncomfortable if I did. But let's get back to, you know, um, you know, wallet protocol. Right. Wallet hygiene. Didn't mean to derail you. Yeah, hygiene. So <laughs> let's come back to that. What are some tips that you can give? Because you have a massive amount of collections. They're not all in one wallet. They're separate. But what are some tips that you're willing to give the general public? So, so a couple things, right? I, I believe that a, a hot wallet and cold wallet and warm wallet strategy are all important, right? I think having, uh, you know, your most prized possessions and assets in a, in cold storage, uh, like, I mean, I'll, I'll share with you. I know that you said, uh, you know, you don't want to know how many wallets I have. I have a lot of ledgers and I still have two unopened ones on top of my desk uh, that I plan on using and deploying. So I have things spread across various ledgers, various hot wallets. Um, I've heard, uh, friends of mine who have like dedicated, uh, computers that they've never really connected to anything. Uh, and they're using hot wallets in those computers, uh, to keep, uh, assets. There's, uh, a, a new project coming out, uh, that is essentially allowing you to use any uh, old school Game Boys to to store your seed phrases and use that as a wallet. I think that's actually pretty cool. That's badass. Uh, yeah, wow. and I'll, I'll be sharing that. I'll be sharing that next week in uh, as one of the tools in the Daily Rafa, so you could be on the lookout for that. But that's actually really freaking cool. Uh, and you play a little game uh, to to recover your seed phrase. So I I think that that's phenomenal. But you know, I think the important thing is. I say this, I say this all the time, slow down. Nothing in this space requires you to be moving at a million, at a million miles an hour. Uh, it, it most definitely feels like that sometimes. And, and people, you know, get all this FOMO and they're like, oh my God, I have to admit. And they, they stop paying attention to what they're signing. I think the bulk of people who get in trouble, get in trouble because they're going too fast and they're not paying attention. So slow down. Uh, one of my favorite phrases and tips is when in doubt, type it out. So if you're looking at a URL uh, and you're not exactly sure who sent you that link, don't click it, type it out, 
you know, make sure that it's spelled correctly. Make sure that uh, like all of the, you know, St- Stephen and I have seen this a million times on ENS names where, you know, people are, are inserting weird characters and all of a sudden you think you're buying this incredible grail and what you're buying is like a, a crappy NFT that somebody has, uh, a, a crappy NFT that somebody has like thrown a, an alternate letter that looks like something else. So slow down, take your time, use some of the tools that are out there like Fire, like Shield 3, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more next week. But that, that's kind of my, my go-to-market strategy when it comes down to wallet security. Like I, I live and die by, by Fire right now, uh, which, is, which is the little app that, that pops up. It's a modal that pops up next to your MetaMask window and it tells you in plain English exactly what you're minting. Uh, that's been a lifesaver. It's actually saved me from four malicious transactions and I don't mind sharing that publicly. Uh, because that just shows you like even me where I'm so involved in this space, I still come across things that are potentially malicious, you know, contracts. I have a question just when it comes to these, you know, wallets or exchanges in general, especially for NFTs, you know, brand new, you know, web two person, never heard about web three, brand new person. What's, what do you suggest? Cause I, I actually went to New Jersey. We did like a whole onboarding program where we showed them how to download a MetaMask and, you know, and get their NFT and what the utility actually means, you know, as opposed to, you know, just, uh, you know, this is the asset that lists on your phone. It's like this asset actually grants you, you know, different things. What would you suggest to a brand new trader who doesn't know, like, you know, what any, you know, any of these terms mean, you know, hard, cold, whatever, would you go for like to a MetaMask? Would you go to like, a, you know, something else? I would send them. I would send them to an exchange where, you, or or a or a marketplace where you could actually buy in fiat and and do like an OAuth authorization where you can connect with your, uh, you know, one of your social accounts or your email. There's a wallet generated on the back end. I mean, if we go back to the top of the show when we were talking about Top Shot and and how they onboarded so many people into the space. At the time, people were just buying NBA moments. Nobody knew like what an NFT was, uh, what what its use case was going to be. But they, it was a Trojan horse into this incredible Web three experience that turned all of us into NFT degens. And and we don't have to go that far if you look at what Luca Nets and Pudgy Penguins did this past weekend with their toy sale. Can um, we talk about that though? Because that's he. I, I I saw on the show notes and like Pudgy Pen. This is the this is the news. This is a Web three company turning Web two, like doing things that the like, companies that are already successful are doing, selling legitimate objects that people can hold. Like that's that's huge. That's it, huge. It, it is huge, and and it it really is. Luca mentioned it during a space that he was on. It is a Trojan horse because what's happening now is you're buying that physical toy. And these kids can now connect to the penguin verse or whatever it is that they call it, the pudgy verse. I, I don't know. I don't know the official name, so don't quote me on that one. <laughs> um, but what it allows those kids to do is trade some of the traits from their physical toys. So it, it's kind of a backdoor into Web3. And I think the more companies do that, I mean, Starbucks is doing something similar with their Odyssey program. All of these people that are in the Odyssey program and are collecting stamps and all this stuff, they don't necessarily know what's going on in terms of their wallet. Like something's being created for you on the back end. When you t- when you think about this IP, I, I thought that was pretty impressive. I watched that video with, with Luca and how they're utilizing it. You buy, I believe, the toy on Amazon and you can buy, I think there are four different types in the collections. You then pull out this card that has this I- IQ a scanning code or a QR. There we go. QR scanning code. You then can create your digital asset so you're creating an nft from the physical so what it's doing is indirectly it's bringing more people in that um don't have any involvement don't have a hot or a cold or a warm wallet know nothing about it and then like hey i got my first nft those conversations are not happening yet on a mass level because we're so far buried in here we almost have to come up and talk to all the other people that have no clue about this ecosystem and to realize that's powerful coinbase one that's powerful but then we also talked about two major connections and we're also going to talk about dead fellas and um what they're doing with their um with their streaming fellas which is another extension of their IP. So we've got IP on three different communities that we've talked about tonight, right? We've got Truth Labs with AJT. We've got Dead Fellows, which I want to talk about in a second. And then we've got Luca from uh, Punchy Penguins, right? And, and more communities doing these IP plays. But this is sort of relevant because we would have that word tossed around so much last year. So 
Maybe we could just talk about Dead Fellows. So right now, what they're doing, uh, if I'm correct, is they've introduced Streaming Fellows, which is an extension of their IP uh, that allows PFP collectors to embody their NFTs through video streaming. Uh, and so they did a detailed thread uh, that was actually, I believe, posted from NFT Now, and uh, really cool. You know, it's 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 neat to see how it's being utilized. That IP, when you hear about IP, intellectual property, it sounds really fancy. It sounds really cool. And I felt like in that last, you know, I say bull run, if that was such a thing, I call it a crazy run. The IP, IP, O, oh, C, O, Creative Commons. Oh, you can do whatever you want with it. And the on-chain monkey, most ex one of the most expansive licenses. However, you know there's certain limitations, so it's kind of like you can go 200 miles an hour, but if you're going to go past that, you got to check with us first. You know, so you can't be too reckless. There are certain things you can and can't do. Uh, you know, Ralph, let me throw it to you, and then Steve, back to you. Uh, you know, what do you think about Dead Fellas and, and Pudgy and how they're testing and playing around with the ideas around? intellectual property wait really quick i have a question with this dead fellow what exactly is it they're doing with ip that they're letting the the con they're doing like ralph uh content creators what like use the avatars like, like yeah so you, so you could use your dead fellas on least let's say a zoom stream right and use okay. that use that or on twitch right and it's like use a filter your, then yeah it's like a filter okay so, cool. uh, <laughs> Ralph, Ralph is not impressed. I am not all. impressed. I'm impressed with these pudgy penguins, though. They're selling on Amazon. That's a real yeah. company. Like, that's huge. Like, that's huge. I've seen filters before, though. Like, isn't there companies that are doing that with, like, any? Like, I've seen pudgy penguins, like, filters, and, like, like, like you know, cool yeah. cats on filters. I think, I think it's not that they're doing something new. I think the way in which they're marketing it is different from how, like, for instance, we had, um, Richard and Boris Wagner, who came on from Spoiled Banana Society, they came on with their ape faces. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. It's a one off. But now when you have a whole community movement, hundreds or thousands of people going, yeah, look at us. We're all in here with our dead fellas PFP. It has a different feeling and it lands very much differently than one off one offs. At least that's my thought. I mean, you look at a kid called Beast, they're doing it all the time with their videos. They're shooting their kid called Beast at a distance. I first saw that uh, two years ago with um, with Vivi. Um, you know, so I, I think it the way it's being introduced and how the community rallies around it again it goes back to one of my favorite words, two favorite words, social currency. Right, because then if you can grab that, you got the attention economy. So the then Gary V effect, the Gary V effect, yeah. we just you keep that, seeing that. That, that, does, that does make sense. So, I so I think that's I think Matt that you're you're spot on with with the Gary V effect, right? I think what what that's doing for dead fellas is if enough of the dead fellas holders start using it on their Zoom streams, on their Twitch streams, it gets out there, and that eventually leads into the toys, the other things. I think that Luca is just so far ahead of everybody else in that space. I mean, the simple fact that that he out pace doodles uh i would have i would have bet a million dollars that doodles would have been first to that game and they weren't uh i i still have high conviction because i think that the team at doodles and and leadership there just based on their ip backgrounds uh could do some amazing stuff but luca's just relentlessly executing with and those memes he took over the meme space kind of like with the gods you know like with frank he kind of took over the content creator space you know, exactly. every, every content creator wants to be like frank and be around frank with luca he, he took over that you know that meme space with those pudgy penguins memes everywhere it's like pepe now you, know, you see pepe exactly. everywhere you know it's, it's, it's very similar i think by the way real quick all roads gentlemen Lead, <laughs> lead back to Pepe. I'm telling you, <laughs> Steven's just like me and Steven like. Mm. <laughs> no, no, Steven, Steven's just feeling salty right now, and I understand. <laughs> and I want you to know, I'm gonna buy you a beautiful cardboard box. But before I do, okay. I do want to talk about the Hume Collective. And if you can, Tony, real quick, cue up that screen share. So we pulled from you and Steven that tonight NBA Top Shot is something we should be thinking about and researching and doing our due diligence. All roads might lead back there because we love the flow blockchain. And we also talked about Knights of DGEN, big fan of what um, Drew Austin is doing. But let's talk about the Hume Collective. Let's dive into music a little bit because you talked about, you know, music and we talked about we talked about sports. But now I want to give people who are listening in some alpha on what projects they should be focusing on. I think Hume might be one of those. What are your thoughts, Ralph? So, so Hume is one of the earlier uh, Web3 record labels, uh, and it's led by David Hume, uh, an, an amazing uh, 
person in the music space has a lot of experience in the traditional music space and they've they've led with angel baby who is essentially a virtual web3 avatar based artist and they have really leveraged their community to make all the decisions around this artist including what's what singles are going to be released next um what are the collabs going to be and they're they're actually using an avatar from the fluff ecosystem uh, the one of the fluff bunnies as the actual artist so i mean they they are as deep as you can possibly go right now in the space and they are doing a phenomenal job and the track is phenomenal as well it's it's a really really good sounding track the ones that they have released so far um and i'm really enjoying being part of that community and love supporting them and uh can't wait to see where they go i love that and so um Tony, if you can queue up a quick screen share. Every week I get the the honor of having my incredible <laughs> co-host on. If anybody's not subscribed to him, go and click that follow button. I like to say engage. Probably one of the best short content creators on all of TikTok. And uh, he holds it down for Penny Boy Stock Alerts. So maybe I'm reading his TikToks a lot. They're good. Okay. They're really good. He, he, he creates some like fun stuff. And by the way, I, I think a little bit of our political realm, which we don't touch upon on this podcast, and I'm <laughs> very much neutral. I want to be very clear. I invite everybody. This is an inclusive community. I stay far away from all that stuff because it won't help grow. And uh, quite frankly, I don't want to be divisive, yeah. but I do love some of the stuff that you report on and you do it in a very fun, lighthearted manner. Craig, uh, really yeah. quick, if you don't mind, I do have a quick follow question to the whole music thing uh, to, to either Ralph Seymour and or, or Craig yourself. Uh, when it comes to, you know, it's like, you know, speaking of music, Paris Hilton, I know she has her new uh, tour coming out in LA sold out show. She is very much involved in the, uh, you know, the metaverse and NFTs. What do you think about the celebrities who are still here? Uh, you know, like Paris Hilton, you know, like, uh, you know, Des Bryant, I was tweet tweeting about, you know, NFTs recently, uh, uh, Paris Hilton, so you don't know, she's dropping, she just dropped, uh, 5,555 avatars. Uh, I believe like some of them would get you tickets to her sold out show. Mm-hmm. What so do you think about celebrities still here, still, still in this? Do you think that they are trying to take advantage or do you think at this point now, like, like they kind of filter out all the ones who are doing that? Ralph, let me just go first real quick. Cause you're going to have a much better take than I. I would say that the celebrities that are here, right? And we don't know because there are certain celebrities just for the money, right? Just like any other human being. But I would say the ones that are here that are authentically building, they're the long game. Five, 10 years down the line, they're going to be big, bigger brands. They're, I mean, how do you get much bigger than Snoop Dogg? Uh, I think if anything, Snoop is just creating more generations of wealth for his family, his family's family, his family's family. But I think that they are... I, I almost want to say it's sort of like the Bezos race. The Jeff Bezos uh, race is, you know, you 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 make exorbitant amounts of money. And I guess at every level, whether it's 25 million, 100 million, 500 million, a billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, and you start going, it, your, your, your finite group, that core is, is much smaller and, and you expand out even further. So I think if, when I think about money, I think, I think the first two things that I think about, especially from a strategy standpoint, and someone can be good or they can be evil. That's any human being. But I think about power and I think about control. Money is irrelevant without those two primary things. So those are my thoughts. So those that are here building genuine, I think that they are continuing to create even more legacy. And then I hope that the ones that are doing it from a genuine manner, really want to make a world impact beyond anything that they could have even imagined, even once they attained fame and fortune. Ralph? Look, I I would agree that the ones that are in this space genuinely care about the space. I think that the ones that were speculating and got burned bad uh, are long gone. But there's there's people like Steve Aoki, uh, who is as deep as you can get in this space. He's got his own Aoki-verse. Uh, they're investing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars into the space. They have a deep-rooted belief that Web3 is the future. Um, him, his entire management team, his manager, Matt Cologne, I mean, they, they are really pushing the space forward. D- despite all of the you know negative connotation around Aoki always being a signal that you've reached the top, and oh no, Aoki bot. He has fun with that as well, but he's he's not going anywhere. There's artists like Grimes, right? She just uh, has made giant leaps and in, in strides forward in the AI space by training a voice model with her voice and and essentially allowing any producer, any music creator, anybody to create tracks and split royalties with her, right? So the people that are in the space are really committed to the space and not going uh, anywhere anytime soon. 
Um, and I think that the ones that, that were just experimenting are, are now out and, uh, you know, w- will they come back? Maybe, but, but the ones that are here, the dead mouses, uh, the Aokis, the Grimes, and, and if you notice, there's a common theme around those, they're, they're on the music side of things, right? There's, there's also some, you know, um, uh, other Al Pacino and, and some of these other guys that have done some interesting things, but, but like the, the music folks are are really bullish on the space i love it man we 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 talked about so many incredible things tonight i think some music some art some sports related digital assets and again once everything comes to meme coin season they're gonna pass through pepe so you can like blow your bags and then (laughs) blow out the i love that and then blow out the wall with all the digital assets and then grab so much money that you're so rich that you can do whatever, buy buildings and homes and throw amazing birthday parties <laughs> with ice cream and cake and champagne. Who doesn't love that? Uh, I do want to, I do want to end it off and start to wrap up now. Cause I think we've had a lot of great content on from this episode and we're going to stay live for about another uh, five to 10 minutes in, in Twitter spaces. And I, I just want to say, gentlemen, as always, Steve, it's great having you on and getting you to come back and give your thoughts. I love these roundtables. I feel like it's when we don't have a specific uh, direct interview or conversation, it's a great way to not only reconnect, but to create more content and stuff that's relevant. Uh, Ralph, every day, I appreciate that daily Ralph. If you guys aren't so- signed or subscribed to it, highly recommend it's five minute or less read. And it comes in every morning, 7 a.m. It's free. It's free. Like, what more do you want? Thanks, and, and, uh, Meta Matt, uh, Penny Boys Alerts, you're doing great things. Again, your short form content on TikTok, I would highly recommend that people connect. And I want to keep you guys in here for, but for before we do, uh, last word from each of you, Ralph, you go, Meta Matt, and then Steve. Uh, I'm extremely happy because while we were just talking, I was able to mint my five Star Wars cryptoids. Yes, I got nice. through. Uh, Amazing show as always. We went through a bunch of different topics. I love having fun with you guys. Uh, it's always a a breath of fresh air to get to hang, to laugh a little bit, to try and derail you a little bit, Craig. We have fun with that. Uh, I, I didn't push you to try and say Nak Amigos tonight, but you know, may, maybe you'll do us the honor of trying before the show closes. But as, as always. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> But anyways, thank you so much, as always, for having me. It was a blast. Absolutely. Now, this was great. It was great having the whole, the whole round table. I know usually it's the podcast format where, you know, we're interviewing one person. It was great seeing, you know, a bunch of different people's, uh, you know, different point of views on different things. It's, you know, it's, I know in Web3, a lot of people agree with each other, but it was, it was nice here, you know, being able to push back and get, you know, positive, uh, you know, responses, which is great because, I, th- I think we need a little more pushback in the Web3 space to get to that legitimacy level, but uh, that's, that's just me. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Mr. Miller. Uh, my final thought for the evening is going to be um, a belated congratulations on Daily Ralpha 500, um, a massive, massive milestone for the Ralpha. Um, and if anybody out there is listening to this and wants to learn a little bit more about wallet hygiene, Drop into my DMs on Twitter. I've got a, um, a little graphic that I was going to share earlier on the show that I'm more than happy to just share in the DMs. Uh, so give me a follow and shoot me a DM and I'll send that over to you. Just all about managing Web3 wallets. That's all it is. So um, it's helpful and it's important to know once you're getting off of exchanges. So that's my final note. Um, but again, I really appreciate you guys for having me back on tonight. It was a blast as always. Love getting a chance to hang out in Craig O's corner. Absolutely. And uh I, yeah, I mean, ending words is uh, there's a lot of great alpha here tonight. And if, you know, from the communities that we talked about, from wallet hygiene, from how people are onboarding, we just covered so many great things and got our perspectives. And um, it's just an honor to have you all on every week and so exciting. And Steve, you know, we'll have you back again. And next week, we're going to be talking to uh, Isaac, who is the creator of Shield 3. It, uh, it does protect wallets and there are certain protocols. So we're going to be going over that. And it, it is at the network level. Sounds fancy. Uh, and then we'll also talk about Fire in that same episode. And we'll be having uh, Sophia on from our on-chain monkey community talking about the small grants 
uh, committee. Uh, and for those that don't know, it's part of the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Sounds very fancy, um, but it's a way to uh, deploy uh, capital in the form of crypto uh, to community members who do apply. So hopefully I said that right, Steve. I get the little head nod. Okay, did it right. And um, let's go over to Twitter Spaces and thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you so much for watching Craigo's Crypto Corner, the best in Web3, blockchain, NFT, and cryptocurrency technologies. Craigo signing off.